Welcome to Free Range Sailing. Join us as we sail around Australia, visiting its wild places in our 30 foot, 50 year old sailing boat, Maroo. Living off the land and sea while sailing a yacht that costs less than a new car, we show that it's possible to have big adventures with a seaworthy boat on a very modest budget. Yeah, good day, mate. Just, um, I just want to arrange coming through the Harwood Bridge tomorrow. Yeah, no worries. The yacht's name's Maroul. All right, mate. I'll sort that out and we'll see you tomorrow. All right, so we're going to go through um, a lift bridge tomorrow. Have Whoa. you ever been through one? Nope. So a lift bridge, you know, the type that comes up and down? You don't see too many of them in Australia. I guess people over in the States is like, ah, oh, geez, you know, a lift bridge, big deal. <laughs> um, you know, we, 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 haven't, we haven't taken Maroul through one yet, so we'll do that tomorrow. Here on my own Counting my own No running into the rock wall. Well, I don't mind driving like this. Out. With a maintained depth of four metres, there are some unexpectedly big boats here in the Clarence River. For the most part, they looked like they were retired and waiting for their final resting place. One old boat that we came across though was anything but ready for retirement. This is the Notorious, a replica 15th century caravel. We were delighted to see it in the river, and we were hoping to meet the owners. Look at you, you look like such a bogan. Who are you talking about? Bogan. A depreciative term for an unfashionable, uncouth or unsophisticated person, especially of low social status. I totally look like a Vogan right now. Apart from the fact that you're steering a sailboat. You have no idea what you're talking about. Just a blue check shirt's not Vogan. I reckon those sunnies and that beanie are. <laughs> With the blue check shirt combined. One o'clock turned out to be a lie. So in between being called a Vogan, I also try and arrange going through bridges. But this time we've had to delay it till five because there was a breakdown. The guy had to clear up and there's only certain times that the bridge can be open and closed. So we've had to delay it from one to five. But the bright side is, it's a nicer light. That's where the devil's powder comes from, isn't it? Sugar. The Clarence River marks the southern boundary of sugar production on the east coast of Australia. Oh, no, I reckon that whole section goes up. up. Yeah. It doesn't go like that, it goes like that. Yeah, I've seen pictures, it goes up. It lifts. And the, so the dude in the little house is just there. Sits the there, goes up and down. <laughs> That's outrageous. So we're just, um, we've got 10 minutes to kill, so we've just pointed up into the current we're holding here nicely. But we've come this distance away just in case the engine conks out. And Pasky can race up there and drop the anchor. Actually, if the engine conks out, I'll race up and drop the anchor because I'm not needed here. Otherwise, being pressed up under a bridge is probably bad for our channel. The Harwood Bridge is part of the Pacific Highway, which is the major transport route along the central coast of East Australia. As you can imagine, stopping traffic of a major Australian highway to race the bridge for yacht-born vagrants has frustrated many drivers. So, a new hire bridge that you can see in the foreground has been built for motorists. The new bridge is not open yet, so motorists had an enforced rest stop for a few minutes while we crossed under the bridge. through and we've got the sweet smell of molasses. Downwind from the sugar refinery. 
We're at our first public pontoon on the Clarence River. And there's free water and free power. And you can stay here for 24 hours. Hmm. It's pretty cool. We can walk right off our boat and go out for a meal instead of having to set up the dinghy. We do have to put some things away though. We will put some things away. We might even padlock our boat. We have to, might have to lock up the boat. This doesn't look like a high, high crime area, does it? No. <laughs> but still. Well, a big pirate ship has just arrived on the dock behind us. It's called the Notorious and it's a 15th century Portuguese trading ship, replica trading ship. And we've actually seen it around in our travels and we understand that the owner has also built the ship. So we're going to go see him and chat with him about his boat and have a tour. Graham and his wife Felicity periodically open their home as a floating museum for curious locals as they visit the towns of Australia. They were kept busy answering questions from their many visitors, so we had a look at this amazing ship while we waited our turn to meet them. The craftsmanship and attention to detail throughout are absolutely incredible. What do you think? We've got dinner on this? Yeah. You reckon you're happy with the metho stove? Well, not really nice. Having <laughs> your back looking over an open fire that's pretty awesome. Done about every day. Notorious is a recreation of a 15th century vessel of exploration, a Portuguese caravel. A caravel? Yep, these were the ships that were developed by Henry the Navigator in the mid 1400s for exploring. And these are the types of ships that all of the early European exploration was carried out on 50 something ton caravels just like this. Small, small. Columbus's and Nina and Pinta were caravels exactly this size, that's right. Um, they had bigger ships than ours, but they were slow, clumsy, you know, needed big crews and deep water and yep. um, whereas the caravels were built to be fast, manoeuvrable, easily handled with a small crew and shallow draft for coastal exploration. Just like Merrill. That's right. It's, a, it's actually a really practical cruising yacht. Um, Prince Henry developed the caravels. They're essentially a collection of all the best points of all the known vessels of the time. They carry latinery from That's the Arab Dows. A bit of Arab technology. Yep, because um, they have some windward ability, plus they're more easily handled with a small crew, all sailed from the deck and everything, so it's much more manageable. These were the first European ships to have a transom and a stern mounted rudder. Prior to that, they were all double enders with a steerboard over the side. Those these features were borrowed from Chinese junks. Yep. So, um, you know, the collection of everything, these were the first ships to be carvel planked. Carvel is a derivation of the word caravel. Ah. Before that, they were all clinkers. Yep. And they built them like that because you could have thicker planks to make them stronger for the Atlantic rollers. Caravels used the latine to go out. Caravels cargo was knowledge. That's what they did. They went out and got the knowledge they brought it back about the prevailing winds and currents and things and that enabled the square rigged ships to which are which are more efficient with a following sea right um the tina is it's very versatile because it can be fore and after we can set it square yep which we spend a lot of time sailing and we've been out 20 to 30 knots and three to four meters in the tasman here we've been up in the helmsman's hutch there laughing 
<laughs> out loud, oh, and this is ridiculous, you know, she's beautiful. Yeah, you know, it must have taken ages to build. Where did you get all the timber from? Um, well, it took nine years full time to build. Yep. Two years researching before I started because there's no plans for these ships. They were built by eye. They hadn't worked out how to do plans in the 15th century. So there's a there's a few tons of wood here. It doesn't look like you've just been knocking off pallets out the back of the supermarket. Uh, well, I did a bit of that. There's, there's It took 300 tons of logs to build it. Um, 300 tons, right. 300 tons of logs because there was so much wastage. They were um, windbreak trees, not plantation grown, so they're very branchy and all that. So a lot of wastage. Um, however, it's fastened almost completely. We have bolts down the keel and in the main knees. But apart from that, it's all wooden nails, which were all sourced from discarded chep pallets. No, nice. so you were right. <laughs> yeah, okay. That, that, uh, when that, I'd that, run that. out of fastenings, it wouldn't be down to the Chandler with a great big checkbook. I'd jump in the van and uh, out to the industrial estate and pull for a few more Good on pallets. You. <laughs> so there's, yeah, a there's three and a half yeah. thousand nails from the main whale down underwater. I don't know how many there are in it all together, but... How do you make a wooden nail? Is you sitting there with um, a spoke shave or... No, I, I set up a lathe with a grinder on it, so it's turned on a lathe. Then, well, before we do that, I'd rip them up into inch square pieces. Yep. Take them inside our house and cook them for a month or two, get them really super dry. Yep. And so that when they go in, they can only expand. Right. Um, then they have a small bandsaw cut in the end and a wooden wedge put in them. They're then, when they're driven in, the wedge comes up against the end of the hole and spreads it like a dyno bolt. Yep. And then you do the same on the outside, cut them off, drive a chisel in, drive a wedge in, and that's it, and they're fantastic. You know, there's no electrolysis, no corrosion, no nail sickness in the timber from having metal fastings in it. They're, um, yeah. Poor old Philip Parker King with his boat falling apart in the Kimberleys, just that reason, iron yep. nails. Yep, yep, well, we get out of all that. Um, they're fantastic things, yeah. And um, is it, is there a predominant timber that you've actually gone with here? Uh, well, there's pretty well only one timber in it, and that is um, Monterey Cypress. Yep. which is a true cypress native to California. Um, no so, relation to the cypress pine from here, it's an actual cypress, whereas this cypress pine isn't a cypress or a pine. <laughs> um, they brought, it's, it's Cupressus macrocarpa, they brought it down to New Zealand in the right. 1800s okay. to replace the cowrie pine for their shipbuilding industry, so the whole reason it's here is for shipbuilding. Then the Scottish farmers took seed to southern Victoria and Tasmania to use as windbreak trees on the farms. And that's where all this has come from because they're a hundred plus a year old now. Yep. They forgot to find out that it's actually valuable boat building timber. So every year in Victoria they push hundreds of tons up and burn it and that's where this came from. We got excavators and unstacked their bonfires and um, took the logs from it. In Tasmania, the boat builders call it poor man's hewan. They consider it an equivalent quality to hewan pine. So it's a, it's a beautiful timber. It's um, soft, light. Its physical properties are a lot like radiata pine. Yep. Main difference being that this is a very durable. It's a, it just doesn't rot. It's got a lot of um, natural resins in it. It's very stable. It has about 3% shrinkage compared to 12% for the gums. Yep. Um, it's an ideal boat building timber. Yeah. And so when you went further up north, a bit closer up to Arnhem Land, did you find shipworm a problem? Or well, we pull her out every year and keep a, you know, anti fowler. Yeah. We use a modern anti foul paint on her, so, yep. you know, same as any wooden boat. Yeah, great. You have to keep an eye on that, yeah. No. That's, uh, yeah, thanks very much. You're very welcome. It's, um, it's amazing how well you've managed it, where you're obviously living on board, but the, just the clever way that you've made all the chests and everything, you can obviously just put it away and people yeah, come and enjoy you. Yeah, we your... pack it all up. It's a bit of an operation to convert it from our home <laughs> to a museum ship and we do need to lock it up very tightly because of all the little pirates who come on every day and yeah. they're very disappointed the chests are locked. Yeah. <laughs> but yep. you've got to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> well, if the Notorious comes to plunder your town, you should go and have a look, especially if you like timber craftsmanship, because it is. It's a, it's a work of art. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming and enjoying it. No worries. <laughs>
You can find out more about The Notorious by heading to their Facebook page, which can be reached by clicking the link in the description of this video. A spinning sail out of the town of McLean. What did you think of the town there, Pasky? Well, McLean, an unexpected surprise. It was a lovely little town, wasn't it, Troy? It wasn't that unexpected. It was on the chart. I mean, it was unexpectedly <laughs> lovely. Do I listen to the cynical old man next to me? <laughs> so it turns out that that pontoon has uh, water, power, hot showers, and a pump-out facility, all for free, and you can stay there for 24 hours. What is that a little piece of Scotland in Australia, they reckon? It is a little piece of Scotland in Australia. There are 200 uh, electric poles with different clan tartans on them. So we checked out some of them, <laughs> and we went for a walk up to the lookout, and we enjoyed some of the lovely little cafes and restaurants around and it was a really beautiful little place. Looking forward to a traditional Scottish Vietnamese soup. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Smells good. Smells really good. It does smell amazing. Legit. Mm. As you'd expect from a Scottish town, I got some very canny bargains at the op shop. Yep. I've got my new $10 shorts. <laughs> I got some other tartan shorts for about twelve dollars. Yep. And so all in all we're pretty thrilled. We always like to scour up shops when we come into country towns, don't we Troy? We do. And one thing if you're looking for them, we find them in every single op shop and they're always like between two and five dollars is Easy yogurt container. We've found them and seen them in every single op shop we've been to in McLean. If you're looking for one to make your yogurt, just hit the local op shop. Or if you're looking for something to make, if you're looking for a fondue set, <laughs> we've got you covered. The, the head of the Clarence River Cruising Club came down and we signed in on the book and he gave us all the details. Yes, yeah, so if you're coming down the Clarence River, look out for us in the book. <laughs> I think um, this, this spinnaker run is the first time we've just taken it easy and we're just doing two knots, but we are going against the tide. Right. And there is basically no breeze. <laughs> There's no wind, is there? Yeah. I, lo I love this cruising <laughs> spinnaker. No wind. Good morning. The sun's not quite up yet and Troy is filming. I got my own package up for that I got at the op shop in McLean. It's really warm. Anyway, let's go check it out. It's really beautiful to be in the countryside. So you don't see it a lot around Australia, but every now and then you'll come across these cable car ferries. So there's a cable going across the river and midstream you've got three metre clearance so we can get across it. And then instead of uh, motoring, they just pull the cables up, pull themselves along the cables and they just go back and forth <laughs> all day. What a job, eh? What do you do? It saves having a bridge here, I guess, but... 
They're sort of quaint, aren't they? Yeah. They don't deal with high amounts of traffic. Something interesting. anchored up here in Brushgrove and we're going to the pub to check it out and have a, a counter meal. <laughs> yeah, pretty excited. It's about time, time for beer. Mornings on the Clarence are a quiet and foggy affair, perfect for mild hangovers. An unusual sight. Yeah, the old cable ferries, they're a bit of a feature of this river. I thought um, we could have we could have gone across, made them wait, but why would you? So did a bit of a um, you know an obvious manoeuvre, let him know and he's, he's gone ahead. We're not in a hurry, but I dare say those people in the car might be. As soon as we wandered into the tool section of the antique store, I knew I was going to have a hard time dragging Troy away. What's that? Oh. Punch. Just feel that old timey spring motion. The baby Bubba John. Baby monkey wrench. set a trap. Finding these old rabbit traps took me back to younger days. Yep. Their use now can land you in prison for up to six months in New South Wales. Pretty good. That's a good thing about having a small boat, you don't get tempted to, to take anything. No. I guess if we had a house, we'd probably... I would have found a few things I liked. <laughs> Look at that, caro burner. <laughs> it's true. Have a seat. Oh no, you have to dig it into the dirt. Well, I just, you don't, have to. You I just don't... I can just balance. Not for me, I think it's Trust me, my way. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on mine. Yeah, get still trying to pack some in there. I got 155. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's a diversion duck. A stalking duck. Stalking duck. So sailing up the river just with a headsail, we don't want a hassle of a uh, mainsail. Marul behaves herself pretty well under a headsail. She, you know, she doesn't fall off or anything. Else. Pretty, uh, pretty easy sailing, really. Hey. What happened? Where's that wind? So what did you think of Old Mara? It was a good little town, wasn't it? Yeah, it was cute. What do, you think of, what do you think of Almara, you little bargain hunter? A little great brick a rack. <laughs> brick a brack. Brick a brack. I've never actually heard someone use that in a sense. It's quite novel. Must be going about six knots there, eh? 5.9 Pascal. You like you being a finely calibrated gauge. The 
The strong wind on the river meant we couldn't pull up to the jetty that night, but first thing in the morning, we were happy to be back in our previous berth because we had some business to attend to. Our septic holding tank was full, and McLean has a public suction facility to empty them. Okay, so we've got a deck fitting here, and we're just gonna take this out, and there'll be another screw-in fitting that goes in here, and then we attach a cam lock, but I won't talk about it, I'll show you. This is probably gonna smell a bit bad when we open this up. Yeah. Screw it, and open. So, we'll go and get the piece that screws into there, and then we'll put the cam lock on. We came and hosed this down before um, picking it up because there was a bit of a suspicious puddle. You are dealing with other people's um, waste as well, so gloves, remember, hepatitis is a thing. So we want this bit out of there, and this is a cam lock, so I'll just get that down. That's a cam lock fitting. Yeah. We'll show you how it works. Okay, so there's our deck fitting. And we'll just screw this cam lock, in, cam lock fitting in there. It'd be a little bit inconvenient having this big fitting just sitting right in the middle of your deck like this. This is the way around it. We've actually got one of these that came with this. But as long as they're supplying one, I'll just use theirs. Okay, so now this is, this is into the deck. And it's called a cam lock because these little cams engage in that. Next step, open that. And now we just go and turn it on and we'll make sure that the breather downstairs is open. Yes. And when it gets down to the bottom, because this has got an automatic shut off, um, once, the, once the tank is sucked and nothing is appearing in that sight glass, then we can just quickly crack our... Um, valve our skin fitting our discharge valve and it'll pull a bit of seawater through there and clean our lines yeah okay so we've got a visual check that that breather's open and when the time comes i'm going to get pascal to actually open this seacock just so i don't touch anything in our boat with these i think the suction open the valve we are at here Okay, so they've got a sight glass, and when the brown, <laughs> solid looking water stopped coming through here and, and like we could see air was pulling through, we got Pascal to shut the breather on the side, and that generated a bit of vacuum in the tank, and then I cracked the skin fitting, so the sea discharge, for about one and a half seconds, and that just pulled enough seawater up through that bottom hose and up through the fitting, and then we just left it run until this was nice and clean. So we should be able to disconnect that from the deck now and our holding tank's empty and our lines are clean. Look at that. It's not nearly as nasty. Oh, look, there's still brown stuff in there. Mm. Disgusting. So you've got gloves on. So we've got gloves on. We'll turn this up that way. Yeah. And so that's, um, that's sucking out a holding tank. Hope you've enjoyed our advertisements for composting toilets. <laughs> if we'd had the room, we would have put a composting head in. With our week in the Clarence River drawing to an end, we had booked an opening time with the bridge operator, and when we got there, we were delighted to discover that we'd be going through with the Notorious crew.
ducking their heads in. Last time with the hot water out there. While we were feeling a bit of a chill, it was nice to see some of the locals had found a way to beat the cold. Thanks for joining us on the river this week. If you enjoyed the trip, hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel. Also, when subscribing to Free Range Sailing, make sure you hit the bell button to stay notified of all our upcoming releases. Thank you.